everybody. Paul Gatter here. We're going to start the show in just a couple minutes. Give everybody a chance to get online. Thank you for being here. Please post in the comments. Let me know where you're watching from. I'd love to see where everybody is across the Indian country. Eliana, I see you in the comments. Thank you so much for being here. Fearless Birdie's here. Julia is here. Thanks, guys. It's going to be a good show tonight. Got a great interview. Be back in just a couple minutes. Let him hear it. Come on over this way. Man, oh man. All right, at this time, we would like to call in Mint Grass. You are up next. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Powell Nation Live. This is the show from Powell's.com. We do every Thursday night at 9 o'clock. I'm Paul Gatter, founder of Powell's.com, and thank you for being here. I'm glad you found us. If it's your first time, this is Powell's.com is all about helping you connect with Native culture, and this is your place. We're open to everybody. For those of I've faces I recognize and names I recognize, Marshall and Birdie. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Sorry. <laughs> Birdie, is, am I, I'm already stumbling over my words. Sorry, Birdie. But welcome, welcome. Tonight, we've got a great interview with um, Brian Young. He is a Navajo art, uh, author. And what's really cool about his books is he's writing, he's creating some fictional tales, but weaving in traditional stories and traditional characters from his Navajo heritage. It's a really cool intertwining of how he's doing that and creating some really cool stories that I think you're going to like and want to check out. So I'll be with that. We'll have his interview in just a minute, but a couple of announcements. First, we do have our giveaway going on through the end of this month, giving away two eighth generation blankets. Here is just one of them. Ready for this? This thing is so beautiful. I'm just showing it to my wife, and she's like, wow, that thing's so cool. Okay, that's just part of it. Look at this. Ooh, this thing is awesome. It is called... We usually have... Uh, this one just has the artist's name on it. Um, Gail White Eagle, who is Muckleshoot. So, 8th generation blanket. Two of them up for grabs. Powwows.com slash win. You can enter daily for more chances. Yes, Birdie, this thing is gorgeous. All right, other announcements. This weekend, we will be streaming live from Prairie Island Powwow. Um, that starts tomorrow evening and runs through Sunday, so check it out. We'll be live on Facebook and YouTube, and you can follow along there. And, and we'll be live on powwows.com, too, if you want to watch on the website. So I hope you'll join us for that. We'll have all the dancing and singing all weekend from the Prairie Island Powwow. That's really exciting. Also, want to tell you about some uh, powwows that are coming up. I can tell you every week, the, the calendar is just filling up, and there are so many going on right now. So, here are just a few this weekend. Uh, Taos Pueblo Powwow happening out in New Mexico. Here's some of the details there. If you're out in the southwest, there's a good one for you. Also, this one is up in Alberta, 46th annual. Let's see, here's a oh, drum contest, 20 for first place. Host drum, Stony Park. Hand drum contest, $1,000 first place. 
Uh, lots of good specials, a jingle dress special, fancy shawl, team dance. They even have a softball tournament and a pool tournament. So if you're up there in Alberta, this is a one you don't want to miss. Midnight Sun is going to be hosting there July 7th through the 9th in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's one of the states, one of the many states, but one of the places I definitely want to get to. I have not been to a powwow in Alaska. Want to get up there. This uh, I have to keep this in mind. We need to get up there at some point. There's the details of that. Also happening in Nebraska this weekend, 7th through the night, honoring the veterans powwow. Here's some of the details with this. That looks to be a good one, too. Sacred Visions powwow is happening in Nevada. Sage Point Singers from Fort Hall, Idaho will be there. Pub, you know, open to the public, native arts and crafts, free admission, lots going on. And one I forgot to pull up, but I'm going to pull it up now. Um, we have been to this one before, not able to make it this year. National Pow Wow. This is taking place in Danville, Indiana, July 6th to 9th. So they got started today. Uh, lots of singing and dancing there. If you're not familiar with the National Pow Wow, they host this every three years, I believe. And lots of dance sessions, good intertribal dancing, lots of, uh, vendors as well as they're having some seminars on different topics beading and ribbon work and there's a craft contest uh my wife placed really high out there one time with her bead work so if you're interested in that go check that out this is a really good one you don't want to if you're in that area you don't want to miss this one very very good dance so there's a some of the just some of the powwows that are happening on the that are on our calendar you can download all of that to your ipad your phone, your desktop, whatever, with our free Powwow Calendar ebook. This is our entire calendar downloaded in one free PDF, powwowcalendarbook.com. Of course, you can always just head over to the Powwow Calendar over on powwows.com and search and find it. Either way is awesome. Eliana says, the red and white is beautiful. Yes, love it. Lynn, welcome, welcome from Navajo Nation. We've got one of, uh, one of your tribe mates over here brian young is going to be interviewed in just a minute one other announcement i'm curious to know has anybody out there i, mean, I know we've got a few followers already but has anybody on here jumped over to the new threads app so if you're not familiar if you haven't seen it already instagram meta has come out with a new app that is a text-based conversation social media platform it takes your Instagram profile and who you follow on Instagram and moves it over into the Threads app. It is available on mobile only if you want to actually post. You can view it online, but if you want to actually interact, you do have to download the app only. We're over there on powwows.com and doing a few things with it. We're going to see how this works and see what people think of it. I'm hoping it stays a conversation platform and a way for us to talk and just engage and not become another marketing tool or another divisive tool and all the other things that social media, the problems of social media is, does. But I'm hoping it stays to be a good platform. All right, Rob from Utah, welcome, welcome. So let me tell you a little bit more about our guest tonight. He's an author and filmmaker. He's a graduate of Yale with a Bachelor in Film Studies and Columbia University with a Master's in Creative Writing Fiction. He is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and grew up on the reservation Currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. As an undergraduate, he won a fellowship with the Sundance Ford Foundation, which helped him do a feature-length script. He's worked on several short films and documentary series produced by the New York Times. He was a participant of the sixth annual Native American TV Writers Lab with the Native American Media Alliance, where he learned to write his scripts in television. And you'll hear in the interview, he talks about writing scripts and, and screenplays and what that how that differs from writing books. But I think you'll enjoy this interview with Brian Young, Navajo author. Well, thanks so much for being here today. I'm curious to hear the kind of the, the story and the, how you got the idea of the writing the books, he, uh, Healer of the Water Monster. I'm not familiar with that story, but it sounds it sounds pretty interesting having a water monster story. Tell me more about it. Of course. Well, thank you for having me <laughs> on your show, um, powwows.com. It's such an amazing pleasure to talk about it. So 
Healer of the Water Monster is based on my nation. I am Dene, otherwise known as Navajo. Um, based on my nation's creation story, Hajine Bafanet, or the story of emergence. And in that story, we Dene believe that we are currently residing in the fourth world. And the third world was a water world ruled by water monsters. And it was in that time that first man and first woman kidnapped a water monster, and thus we were um, barred and <laughs> um, forbidden from living in there. And that's how we came into the fourth world. So water monsters in my book um, and the fictional additions I made to the creation mythology, I say that water monsters followed those first beings first man first woman turkey all the bugs um, animals winged animals um, after those first beings emerged into the fourth world i say that water monsters emerged after them as well and with them they brought water which became the sources of water in the Nebikea. so for those of you who don't understand what the Nebikea means it's kind of a, the land of the navajo um, literally but it kind of refers to the traditional um, ancestral homelands of the Ne, um, which is current, which is in the four sacred mountains, so Sistanjina, or uh, the eastern sacred mountain, so Zilf, southern sacred mountain, Doko Slid, uh, western sacred mountain, and Nahon um, Kostriko, um, the Ben Sat, the northern sacred mountain. And I forgot all their English names, but I do know <laughs> that um, the southern one, so Zilf, is. Um, just outside of Grants, New Mexico. And the Western one I know for sure is San Francisco Peaks. And that's just right outside of Flagstaff. And the Northern one is, I believe, in Southern Colorado. And the Eastern one, I completely forget where it is, but I just know it's East. Um, so that's um, the Nebikea, the traditional ancestral homelands. And I say that water monsters brought water from the third world, and that became the foundation of all the moisture on the Nethikeia. And in the story, um, there is a young Navajo boy. His name is Nathan. So he is modern, contemporary. He has a smartphone. He's very into video games. He comes across a sick water monster while spending his summer with his paternal grandmother, whom he calls Nali in church rock new mexico so that's just uh, like about a 40 depending on how fast you drive 20 to 40 minute drive away from gallup new mexico and so this water monster has been sick for about 30 years and because the water monster is sick um, there is a drought a 30-year drought because the water monster that nathan encounters he has to sing a collection of 12 songs in order to make it rain in that area. And because of the sickness that he is enduring, he's unable to sing the songs. So Nathan is tasked with healing the water monster to end the drought in that area. And it's been um, a very long journey getting it from when I first had the thoughts and into a book. That's awesome. And it, it, the book's out now, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, when I've, I've talked to several authors, and everybody comes kind of comes at writing a different way. Some people are, you know, come through and, and train and are, you know, have English degrees or whatever. But your background, I think, is a little more in film. So what's the difference in telling stories um, in film or script writing and then in the book? You know, what was that that experience like? I feel like with writing for scripts and, you know, television, film scripts, it's a largely external um, medium. Like you have to put a lot of emphasis on the visuals and indicate internal emotions through external movements. Um, not to say that, you know, great script writing doesn't have internal elements, but largely it focuses on describing the world, describing the characters, describing action. So it's very, very external. And when I started writing Healer of the Water Monster, it initially began as a feature like script. Um, I was living in Albuquerque at the time. It was the mid 20 teens. And I absolutely hated writing it as a feature link script um, because there's a lot of rules and constraints um script screenwriting is a very very economic art like you have to very very 
efficiently condense everything into a 120 page script. And when I was writing it, um, Heal the Water Monster, the idea just kept growing and growing and growing. And I felt like it was going to be a multi movie. Um, to do the story justice, it had to be right. multiple movies. And in addition to that, um, part of the reason why I had such a frustrating experience writing it, at least as a feature length script, was a lot of the attitudes towards native stories in film, whether it be TV or you know feature length movies, was very negative. Um, we, me and other native filmmakers in Albuquerque at the time, we were working on our scripts. We were directing each other and helping each other with our short movies and films. And we were just like literally working for, for nothing. We were, we were working for the love of stories and each other. And when I was writing Heal of the Water Monster, I knew that a lot of the obstacles that I was encountering being a native screenwriter would have applied to healer of the water monster as a feature in the script and a lot of times me and my f native filmmakers we were told like if you want to sell the script you have to make your main character white or half white so a white actor could play the role and that really frustrated me and i did not want to make that accommodation for the story because healer of the water monster is deeply entrenched in Navajo philosophies, Navajo storytelling, the Navajo creation mythology, and just present day living conditions on the Nepikea, on the Navajo homelands and the Navajo reservation. And yeah, that's where a lot of my frustration came from. It's just like, I knew that those restrictions of the hundred page script were going to be there and the story kept getting bigger. And I knew that once I got it to a pitchable position, I would be encountering those often racist sentiments that there is no audience for native voices. Like that was the mindset of the time for a lot of film executives. And it just dawned on me one day, it's like, you know, you're hating writing this, you are frustrated, but you love the idea. Why not try a book? And I don't know why I, that thought came in, but I'm thankful it did because that was a pivotal point in how healer the water healer the water monster came out to be and the moment i started writing of the book all those restrictions were gone all the because the nature of the story healer the water monsters deals with depicting uh Deneth deities or as i call them holy beings and there were a ton of them being represented in my book i knew that to do the story justice if it were a film it would need a very very big budget a very very sizable budget to do the depiction of these holy beings justice so writing the script i was just like this is gonna be expensive this is gonna cost a lot and i'm already dealing with that mentality of there's no audience for native voices and when i pivoted to writing a book all those frustrations all those anxieties all that anger i was having towards the industry film industry just disappeared and all i found in writing the book was just space and freedom that i didn't have while being a screenwriter and so that's initially how i started down the path of becoming um, an author and turning it into a book as opposed to a movie first and how wrong those people were. I mean, now I feel like we're in a total renaissance of native storytelling in, in TV and movies. Uh, there seems to be a real appetite for it. Uh, it it's funny how times swing, right? <laughs> um, well, and so thinking about that, how is, as the book has been out there, um, for me, it's interesting to see in this renaissance of storytelling that people outside uh, of kind of Indian culture are, are really are engaged in these stories, whether it's reservation dogs or spirit uh, rangers on Netflix, the, the animated show that there is people coming in from the outside and hearing these stories. So how is it have, how, how has the reaction been um, from people outside reading this? Are they, you know, are they accepting of it? Are they curious? Or, you know, what has that been like? Yeah, I definitely agree that there has been a huge push to diversifying the stories that we are producing and also engaging with. And I'm very thankful for that. 
especially in the publishing industry, um, that push has been there um, and has been, I don't want to say capitalized, but has been um, helped with that, with um, We Need Diverse Books, uh, with the movement on Twitter, such as um, hashtag DVPit, hashtag Own Voices. So even before this huge renaissance in the film industry, there was a huge push for diverse voices in the publishing industry, specifically for young readers. And I, when I pivoted towards writing a book as opposed to a screen, that's when that kind of wave, when that initial push was really starting to gain traction. And it's been a wonderful experience, um, largely because now I can have actual numbers to point to these film executives who initially told me there's no, <laughs> there's no audience for <laughs> native, right. native stories. It's just like, well, here we go. Here's um, what your fear and what your prejudices prevented you from seeing. Um, we have been telling stories, we as indigenous peoples all across the United States, United, Nation, United States, all 570, I believe 78 nations, federally recognized nations and the state recognized nations. Like we have been storytellers long before we were colonized. And we have our own forms of storytelling that are unique to our indigenous heritages. So when it comes to readers and audiences who aren't specifically Navajo, because you know, even native people who aren't Navajo are, I'm very, very thankful, are really, really engaging with Healer of the Water Monster. And I call it Nathan's story because it, it really is, Nathan's the main character. And it always just felt like to me that it was his story. But a lot of non Diné people have warmly welcomed his, his journey. And I'm very thankful for that. And I think a lot of that is, um, it's just that, uh, gosh, I'm going to sound like um, <laughs> just someone who's all up in his own his own head. Um, I feel that I did the best I could telling the story and the effort, the love that I had invested into this helped strengthen it to the point where it can be approachable and digestible by many different people from different nations. And also, it's just Nathan's a kid. Um, his indigenous his indigenous identity is a part of who he is. Yes but he's dealing with, with kid stuff. Um, he is the son of parents who are going through a divorce. And unfortunately that's pretty common for a lot of us these days. So there are universal aspects of just him existing in a modern world that a lot of kids can relate to. Um, so that's been really, really exciting to see that non net people are, you know, um, <laughs> welcoming to his story. And, uh, and so you kind of touched on what I was going to ask next, you know, with, with some of the stories that are out there now, uh, it's kind of twofold. What I like to see is, you know, we have people um, that are learning to appreciate different aspects of native culture, understanding it better, understanding what it's like to, to live on a reservation or what it's like to be an, an urban Indian. But then also the stories that, that you and others are telling are so relatable because they have universal uh, morals and universal lessons. So yeah, what are some of those things that you're hoping that uh, young kids or adults are going to be able to take from, from Nathan's story? Well, specifically with Healer of the Water Monster, my debut book, um, I, I tried not to be too didactic or too um, teachy, I guess is another word to say. But if there is one thing that was a guiding kind of uh, philosophy that I wanted to imbue to young Navajo kids, specifically young Diné um, male kids, is that kindness is powerful, that there is healing, there's power, there's medicine in being kind. I always felt that Nathan was just a normal kid, that he was could be anyone that you see on the reservation or in his specific case because he lives in phoenix he's also an urban indigenous kid um he's just a regular kid that you meet 
while walking down the street, going on the bus or in the train. I guess Phoenix doesn't have trains. <laughs> um, but he's just like a regular res kid. And so for me, that was a very important thing that he wasn't this chosen being because of ancestry of, you know, being a descendant of, you know, some powerful God. Like, no, he's just a regular kid who happens to be um, Navajo, who happens to have this amazing capacity for empathy and kindness. And I always, always felt that Nathan's superpower is empathy and kindness. And that allows him to interact with a lot of the Dene holy beings, the Dene deities, and allows him to go on this amazing journey and carries him through this amazing journey. And in addition to the storyline of Nathan healing um, the water monster, he's also healing his uncle. So there are two storylines happening that deal with the healing journey. There's the water monster aspect and the his uncle Jet, who is a wartime veteran who is dealing with PTSD, substance abuse, specifically alcohol, and depression as well. And especially with a lot of kids on the reservation, having a family relative who is addicted to substances, not necessarily just alcohol, but also having to deal with undiagnosed anxiety disorders, like that's unfortunately a very, very extremely common experience for a lot of res kids. So that was very important for me to get across was that his, because of his ability to want to help, to be kind to people around him, that's what allows him to go on this journey and to succeed or, oops, spoiler alert, <laughs> succeed <laughs> or not succeed um, in his quest. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm anxious to get into the book and, and read it myself. Um, so we finished our first book now. Our, our, what's next? Are we, are you going to go back into doing some script writing and working on some, some films or uh, are we working on more books? What's next for you? So actually, my there second book just came out All right. <laughs> a few weeks ago, um, May 23, and it's, um, I feel like it's a sequel, but my editor, publicist, they call it a companion novel, and they are the professionals in labeling these stories, so I'm going to go with that. It's a companion novel, but it's a direct continuation, and I'm so very proud of it. It's starting to get a lot of critical praise and reviews um but it definitely continues uh, especially with the recent supreme court ruling against the navajo nation and our sovereignty over water rights um i feel this is a very timely book because it talks about well it alludes to navajo nation water rights um so as I mentioned earlier, um, while I was describing the synopsis for water, healer of the water monster, water monsters um, control and protect bodies of water, including rivers, lakes, and ponds. And so the first water monster to follow us, her water became the foundation of all the water on the Navajo Nation, which be, is the San Juan River. And so when she returns to the fourth world because she's been in the third world healing for 160 years when she returns in, to the fourth world she discovers that her water has been draining that it's almost on the verge the tipping point of drying out so she believes that there is a huge monstrous enemy that is stealing all her water um, and all the water across the nefikea on um, the navajo nation so she nathan and this new protagonist his name is edward um, go on a quest to find this enemy before it can cause destructive, before it can cause cata cataclysmic destruction on the fourth world. All um, right. There's so much I want to talk about, but I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. So that's All right. Uh, All right. So we got two out. Working on. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a trilogy. <laughs> I'm hoping to do a quadrilogy. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah, um, because with uh, the ne philosophy, and I feel like a lot of indigenous philosophy, like four is a very sacred number. And so when I was writing Heal the Water Monster, I had that kind of goal to do four books. The first one is East or uh, Ha'a, and the south, 
Southern is he heroes. So I have two more West and North um, to do. <laughs> so we will see, um, but definitely four. I have ideas on where the story could go and very excited to see what happens. But my agent and I are also discussing and planning and strategizing how and when to pitch these books to um, streaming services is my goal. Um, because there has been kind of little interests here and there to buy the movie rights for these books, but that would be the next step um, for transitioning this into a cinematic interpretation. And when I was writing, when I made that pivot towards writing a book, it was always kind of this long-term goal of first writing the book, then demonstrating to those film executives, uh, hey, dumb, dumb hats, <laughs> <laughs> or hey, you people who told me no, look at these numbers, look at my sales, and then making it into a movie eventually, or a cinematic version of it. Love that. That's awesome. And it is crazy that, you know, they, they missed. Yeah, it's one of the things you mm -hmm. can go back now and t say, I told you, so, but man, what a miss. Um, they, had, they had it there and, and could have moved forward with it and been on the forefront. Um, that's, a, that's a bad one. Um, so I always like to ask people, um, you know, as a storyteller, if, if there's somebody watching that is interested in, in, you know, whether it's writing or screen or scripts or whatever, and they want to tell stories and what is your advice, what kind of, who are your role models and, and what's the, what's a path that people can go down to, to becoming a storyteller like this? I personally think, um, ingesting and reading, especially if you're wanting to write books, um, read as many books as possible. Um, especially books that you personally do not like and ask yourself, why isn't this working for me? Why do I not like this book? And try to pinpoint these moments when, you know, you don't like a story or you're disengaged in a story or and on the opposite end, when you find a book that you really do enjoy, like how did that author hook you into it and maintain um, keeping your interest? And similar with screenwriting, read scripts, as many scripts as possible. There are resources online that have PDF versions of many, many public domain um, scripts. And just figure out like how, how you became invested in that script and when and why and also with scripts that you don't like as well like when and why did you not like certain things and the more you kind of can pinpoint these moments the easier it will be for you to kind of write and create these moments for yourself and especially as indigenous people i'm also going to say listen to your elders listen to your traditional stories because we have these avenues to connect to our ancestors through these stories. And these stories are here for a reason. They helped our ancestors navigate the world around them. And so there is so much value. And if you can try to connect with an elder and talk about you know, traditional forms of storytelling, because our ancestors also had our own philosophies. And that's very, very, very sacred and very, very special. And if we don't continue our own tribal forms of storytelling, then it's going to get lost, man. And that's not, not a good place to be. Like it, it, the world would be a lot less rich if, it, if we ever do lose these forms of storytelling. So in addition to, you know, engaging with stories in the Western world, engage with stories in your traditional world as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us and talking about your books. Um, uh, and I hope everybody out there will go grab a copy. Uh, it, they're available on all the normal resources, correct? Yes. So I am published with Heart Drum, which is a native focus imprint, the first native focus imprint at one of the big five. It might be the big four right now. Um, but being a part of that family with HarperCollins, um, my book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart even, Target. Um, if they don't have it, um, you can also like request and order it. But I highly recommend buying from indigenous bookstores, such as Red Planet Comics and Books, which is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, as well as BirchBarkBooks.com, which is owned by the amazing Louise Erdrich. Um, 
So if you can, try and buy from indigenous booksellers. That's great. And I knew about Red Comic. I did not. I think I've heard of the, the Birch store, but um, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for the resources. I hope everybody will go and grab a copy. And thank you so much. Again, appreciate you spending some time with us and telling us about your stories. Thank you. I appreciate um, being on here. Thanks again, Brian, for coming on. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Like I said, it's a really cool way he has melded his stories together using his traditional Navajo teaching and the, the stories from the Navajo and, and working that in. Super cool. If you've got some young kids, um, great books for them. I think I may buy them too and, and check them out. I think it'd be a really good read. Saw lots of good comments. I appreciate you all, you all um, posting all that. It's good stuff. <clears throat> Lynn says, thank you. Yep. Good luck, Jim. Good advice and guidance for sure. He's a, um, I, I, I'm excited to see where he goes from here. Uh, and uh, you know, a TV deal, movie deal, this thing hitting screen, it could be really cool, right? I mean, it sounds like a, a great set of stories that he could tell with these. So pretty exciting. Again, thanks everybody for being here tonight. Don't forget, we're giving away two eighth generation blankets this month. Powwows.com slash win. Enter daily for more chances. These are awesome. Don't miss your chance to win one of these. we got two different blankets. That's just one of them. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe Stay safe out there. I hope you get some, spend some time with the family. And we'll see you back here next Thursday night, 9 o'clock. And don't forget Prairie Island Live all weekend on Powwows.com, our Facebook, and our YouTube. And if you need another social network, head on over to Threads and check us out over there. But thanks for being here. I'll see you soon, everybody. Good night.